I still remember the first time I looked in a mirror and felt disgusted with what I saw. I was five years old, all geared up wearing my team swimsuit, ready to take photos with my diving team at the community pool. I saw the other girls on my team as lean and thin and beautiful, and I felt ashamed of how my own chubby legs and protruding stomach were, at least in my eyes, standing out in a bad way. And looking back, I really don't think any person could have told one five-year-old from the next, all of us wearing the same swimsuit, our hair wet from the water. But what a sad reality it is that each person sitting here today likely has a similar experience or story. <laughs> Anxiety about our bodies and insecurities about our bodies are things that affect us all universally, perhaps to different degrees and for different reasons, but universally all the same. What I do not want to do today is come up here and talk about how magazine covers or social media are the causes of millions of eating disorder cases across the US and around the world. That story has been told, and at a place with so many critical thinkers like here at Wellesley, I really don't think I need to go on about the evils of Victoria's Secret models or the Kardashians' newest foray into body modification. <laughs> that is not only the narrative of eating disorders that has permeated wellness spaces for decades, it also is one that I personally feel reduces eating disorders to disorders of vanity, simply trying to reach a perfect body or fit some societal standard. Moreover, that, narr that narrative of eating disorders is also one that centers the stereotypical white, cisgender, thin, affluent woman, usually under 30, a perfectionist with an equally stereotypical, overbearing, all-American almond mom, as the TikTokers call it, um, who holds onto her diet culture beliefs at first and then valiantly overcomes them to help her daughter heal. And here I am. Chinese, far from underweight, immigrant parents, where do I fit in? I was in sixth grade when I first started consciously restricting food. What started as casual disordered eating, as unfortunately so many of us go through, became something more serious slowly throughout high school and on my gap year. I felt unable to control so many elements of my life that I in turn became obsessed with controlling what I ate until nothing else mattered to me outside of eating and retaining as little food as possible. In doing so, I believed that I could have full control over how I felt and who I was. At a routine doctor's office visit, I got one of those mental health surveys that they give everyone and in a fit of madness, I checked off the boxes asking whether I had ever eaten less in order to change my body or whether I had ever induced vomiting as a form of weight loss. I had never brought these issues up to my mom before and she was in the room, so I was terrified of the conversation that the pediatrician was about to have with us when she came back in the room. So I closed my eyes, I braced myself, and that conversation never happened. Instead, the doctor let me know that since my weight was in the overweight BMI range, that I was right to be concerned about my weight and supported my efforts to lose weight by any means necessary. She told me that I should maintain a daily diet of at or under a certain number of calories that we'll just label as X. Um, X number of calories, I would later learn, uh, is barely enough food to keep a toddler alive. They were not enough even to maintain normally bo normal bodily functions at my height and at my age, never mind fuel any movement throughout the day. And even worse, I had already been eating less than that number of calories for quite some time up until this point, but the doctor never even asked me what my habits were. She just assumed what they were based on what the scale said. Around the same time, I went to a, a psychiatrist and I told her about my symptoms as well, what I was doing, how I felt. She responded by looking me up and down physically and then asking whether I was using behaviors normally associated with binge eating disorder, despite my having just explained to the contrary. I knew that something was wrong and I was looking for help in the places that were told to me were the right places to look but I wasn't being heard simply due to the size of my body. 
According to the National Association of Anorexia Nervosa and Associated Disorders, less than 6% of those suffering from eating disorders are medically underweight. A study led by researchers at the Stanford University School of Medicine discovered that those who exhibited a restrictive eating disorder but were not medically underweight are not only under-recognized and under-treated, but also just as sick medically and psychologically as anorexia patients who were underweight. And that's not even taking into account the suffering that all people with non-restrictive eating disorders go through that are even less associated with significant weight loss. In addition, according to the National Eating Disorders Association, people of color are significantly less likely to get help for their eating issues. I personally will never forget the day a physician told me that I was too big for an Asian girl, presumably assuming what kind of body would be healthy or acceptable for me based on the stereotype that Asian women live in smaller bodies. It wasn't until I started suffering many of the medical symptoms of malnourishment that I was finally able to find a therapist who listened to me and who believed me. I was finally diagnosed with anorexia nervosa as well as OSFED, which is like a catch-all disorder for people who display symptoms from two or more separate eating disorders. This was in the summer of 2020, the summer after my first year at Wellesley College and the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic in the US. With my therapist as my advocate, I would spend the next two years in a partial hospitalization program as well as several different intensive outpatient programs. So the next battle I had to fight was largely with myself. Though I had focused so much of my time and energy up until this point on getting help, accepting it was the hardest part of the entire process. Because now that everyone around me believed that I deserved help, I stopped buying into the concept altogether. I told myself that I couldn't have a real eating disorder if I wasn't underweight, and that maybe my body just needed less food than other people's. Um, I even denied a stay at a residential facility when it was pushed on me because I just didn't think I was sick enough to go. Much of this attitude comes from the cultural background that I grew up in. Growing up in a Chinese household, emotions such as guilt and shame are presented to us as tools for self-improvement. And I certainly wanted to be in a state of constant self-improvement. I mean, who doesn't, especially at Wellesley? Um, <laughs> be it by earning better grades as a student, increasing my skill as a musician, or at this point, above all else, controlling what I ate. Any mental illness derived from this kind of pressure is invalidated because there's no reason you should ask for help to deal with emotions that are there to help you. In addition, culturally, my weight, as well as how much I eat, surprisingly, are markers of whether I possess the discipline not only to maintain a certain body shape, but to be successful in life. Furthermore, my parents come from a society where mental health is severely stigmatized and rarely spoken about, meaning that they have no concept of what an eating disorder even is, much less the ability to help me recover from one. There's a reason they're not here today. Um, they couldn't educate themselves or speak effectively with my providers because resources about eating disorders don't exist in Mandarin. And because of all of this, treating my eating disorder didn't mean simply tackling American diet culture values or anything I might have been imposing upon myself through perfectionism or anxiety or what have you. It meant dismantling an entire system of cultural and generational trauma that has existed for centuries. Not only did I face barriers to recovery in the Chinese culture that I grew up in, I also was hard pressed to ever find a treatment center where I felt 100% comfortable. And every single one that I've been to, I've always been one of, if not the only person of color in the room. Because people of color with eating disorders, as I mentioned earlier, are still severely underdiagnosed and undertreated. All of my practitioners have been white, simply because there aren't enough Asian dietitians, therapists, or psychiatrists in the field, never mind those who specialize in eating disorders. Just as a tiny example of this, according to the Association of Social Work Boards, only around 3.7% and 3.4% respectively of licensed marriage and family therapists and licensed social care workers identify as Asian or Pacific Islander. These are two of the main licensures that a therapist can get in order to treat patients. 
70% of marriage and family therapists, however, and 64% of social care workers are white. Though I have an incredible treatment team to whom I owe my life, it is still important to highlight the gap in care that I was dealt due to the lack of diversity in, within treatment areas. It meant constant code switching with my providers. It meant that the cultural roots that I mentioned earlier of my eating disorder were left largely untouched by them for me to tackle on my own. It meant putting an extra effort to modify my meal plans in order to incorporate the cultural foods that I was eating at home, because the plans that we were given were that much harder to follow with traditional Chinese dishes that can't be parsed down to specific amounts of fats and carbohydrates and proteins like a sandwich can. Each one of these factors has been a huge obstacle in my own recovery and continues to be for all people of color currently seeking treatment within this white dominant field. I really hope that everyone leaves here knowing a little bit more about the nuances of eating disorders, as well as the fact that anyone can display any symptoms of any eating disorder at any body size. And weight-obsessed health practitioners stop us from pursuing health when they start to view health as a function of weight, which it definitely is not. Like health, eating disorders are about so much more than the weight. They are severe mental illnesses stemming from different sources for each individual who suffers from one, be it overwhelming anxiety, depression, trauma, big life changes, or any other kind of emotional strife that we might decide to replace with controlling our food instead. Racial and cultural identities factor largely into the development of an eating disorder as well as how someone responds to certain types of treatment. And ignoring this fact simply leads to ineffective treatment as well as leaves large communities unable to receive or respond to help properly. The future of accessible, equitable eating disorder treatment includes increasing diversity amongst practitioners as well as increasing the number of practitioners who can understand how race and culture can factor into the development and recovery processes of an eating disorder. It also includes dismantling weight stigma within our own shared culture as well as in the medical field so that more people can get the help that they deserve. Lastly, the single most important tool that any of us have in this battle is education, be it learning or unlearning what health can look like for us and for the communities that surround us. It is just a tiny piece of that education that I hope to have brought to the stage today, and I feel so grateful to have had the opportunity to share my story, both in its aspects that are personal to me, as well as in those that might shine a light on someone else's recovery. Take care of your siblings, Wellesley, and thank you so much for listening to me speak today. <laughs>